Welcome into the Just Basketball Show for Thursday, August 3rd. I am Chris Manning. That is Brendan Clean. If you haven't already, follow us on your podcast platform of choice and give us five star reviews only. And hit subscribe and the notification bell on the Just Basketball Fans YouTube channel. Today's show, we're going to play a little game Brendan has concocted. We're going to talk about Anthony Edwards saying awesome stuff and that he's changing his jersey number. And we're going to talk about five guys we cannot wait to see next season. Five-ish. We're going to alternate back and forth. We're still a bit away from the season starting, but it's August. We got through for agency. Let's get a little excited for for the basketball to come. This is the Just Basketball Show after all. So let's talk about some some basketball stuff more and no more J- James Harden and Dame Lillard. Like we've done enough of that until we get trades or a new update or there's a, a memo sent about James Harden or something like that. So... Take it as you we will. We want equality on the memo t- front. We want we want memos for everybody. Really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just just give me a give me a memo on like anything. Uh, I want to tell you too about our friends, especially if it could have been a meeting. Give me a memo. Uh, founded in. Want to tell you about our friends at Homage as well. Founded in two thousand seven, Homage is an ultra comfortable specialty apparel company that uses vintage inspired designs to pay homage to the greatest stores, traditions, and figures across sports, music, and pop culture. They have a ton of great licenses, NBA, WNBA, NFL, MLB included. And they're not just not just another fan t-shirt company. They craft the softest, most nostalgic clothing for sports fans, pop culture aficionados, and everybody in between. So click the link in the description below. Buy yourself something nice. Buy someone you care about something nice. Buy your enemy something if you want. I don't know. Just do whatever in your heart. Some of the money from your purchase, if you use that link, comes back to support the Just Basketball Show. So please... Go and do that. Brennan, let's start with the Make It Basketball game and bring us in. Let's talk about it. Let's tell me what this is yeah, going to be. This is, uh, this is just an admission that there's not a lot of NBA news happening right now. We got the World Cup later in the month. We'll preview that when you are back from New York City, and we will have men's basketball to talk about. We just hit the WNBA with Sabrina Merchant, so that means it's time to look outside the NBA and at other sports stories. Um, some of these may be slightly outdated, by the time um, people are hearing this, but they're the biggest they're the biggest stories of the moment. I guess, you know, unless something big happens, this is it. We have two from MLB, one from NFL. We'll start with some non-news, something that didn't happen that counts as the biggest story in baseball right now, which is Shohei Otani not getting traded. And what we're going to do with each of these stories, Chris, is we're going to debate or track down what the closest parallel in basketball, not just right now, but in basketball history is. The game is called Make oh. It Basketball. Okay. So we're taking news from not basketball, and we're making it basketball. The name okay. really tells the story there. It's nice uh, synergy in terms of communicating sure. the point. So to return to the news item that I already listed off, Shohei Otani not being traded. I have one idea. But obviously, yeah, I, I, it's, it's more yeah. than just Shohei not getting traded at, at this one deadline. It is like they're going to lose him now, right? It's like the decision to go down swinging and be okay losing a generational talent, if not the best ever, for literally nothing. That's what it is. So what comes to mind? How are we going to make this basketball? The, the part about losing him is, I think, the hardest part for me to square. The not trading a generational player thing to me goes to Kobe Bryant not going to the Chicago Bulls. That's where my brain went as far as mm-hmm. here's this generational guy, this mega superstar, popular guy, most popular guy in the league, jersey sales out the wazoo, all that stuff. Kobe didn't get an entry into the Bulls, stays with the Lakers. I think this story, that story would have been a much crazier. I, I imagining what that story would have looked like in a social media world I think would have been really interesting. Um, just the, the, the TikTok of it and what the pressure would have looked like. I don't have like a great answer for the latter half of this, that he's just going to go sign for $500 million with the Mets or the Yankees or the Dodgers in, in a few months. Right? Like I don't know what the exact NBA comp is for that, but I do think the Kobe one is what comes to mind as far as a trade goes. When you said TikTok, I realize now you meant like the moment to moment. I thought you just meant like you were really going to – like you were just imagining like some sick edits about like from twelve year olds about the whole thing. TikToks like um, TK. Well now mean. I am now I am, but I meant I meant the old version of TikTok. 
So 2004, I think, is one of the times when Kobe Bryant was going to go. And then I think there was another one in 2007. 04 would have been, I, I think, as a free agent. 07 would have been a trade, yes. Uh, and the, he did have a no trade clause and all that stuff, but he would. I think the story goes that he realized how much he was going to have to give, they were going to have to give up and said, never mind. I like that one. That implies that there was like a trade close, though, right? So it's like, I think, I think the hilarious part about the Angels thing is like, they didn't even really seem like they explored it that much. And everybody's sort of just laughing in their faces. They're like, no, we're buyers. So I didn't, there's not an easy parallel because Otani's just so much better than everybody else. This is like Michael Jordan leaving the Bulls or if LeBron had left the Cavs under different circumstances, but neither of those are perfect. So where I went is Magic, the Magic, the Orlando Magic, letting Shaq go to LA. Okay, that's a good one. That's a good one. Because it's like it was just staring them in the face. And I looked I looked at like an article about it too when I was prepping this. And like obviously the Kobe thing, now that you're bringing him up, like one of the most insane trades in NBA history, which is the Lakers getting Kobe in the same trade that they dumped Vlade Divac to create the cap space to steal Shaq from the Magic. So it was like two historic birds with one stone. The trade's not so much the, the making a basketball part here, but just the magic just just sucking in the whole dynamic of maintaining a generational talent and allowing Shaq to walk out the door. That was the closest one I could get to. You like it? I think that's better than mine. I think you did. Because the Shaq part of it is they actually left and got a bunch of money. And now you look at... And he went to a big Where, market, right? Like, and he, and he went to a big market. Which, like, Otani's going to go to the Dodgers or the Yankees and just make Angels fans cry for the next mean, 15 years. You mean my beloved Cleveland Guardians can't get in the race for uh, for Shohei? Is that what you're telling me? I mean, get in the race. All it takes is, like, one little leak to, like, Buster Olney where they're like, they're, we're interested. And then, you know, it shows up in a tweet. Makes fans happy. Yeah, but I, I, everyone, I think everyone under the sun is interested in Shohei Otani to be like, it's one of those things where, like, I'm sure everyone at the time was like, can can we get a meeting with Shaq? It's like when, every time LeBron's been a free agent, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, there was a rumor once upon a time when LeBron was a free agent uh, leaving Miami where I believe it was when he was leaving Miami where there was like a tweet from Woj of both Carmelo Anthony and LeBron James considering coming to Phoenix. So I experienced the uh, frenetic, insane dreaming that happens when an insider puts that out there. All right, let's move on to the next one, which is a, the the most like shocking trade of the baseball trade deadline, I would say, which is Max Scherzer going to the Rangers. Yeah. So this is kind of out of nowhere, expensive, aging player who... A little bit maybe washed, we're not sure, type of thing going on. But somebody who's very famous and who goes to a maybe smaller market. Like, there's a lot of angles of this that are NBA-ish. You can pick whichever one feels best to you. I have an example, like I said, but you go first. Rudy Gobert. Mm, I like it. A little older. Obviously, like, Rudy was coming off a lot of successful seasons, but the age he's at, the contract he's at, it's... It's not a. Uh, it's not for everyone. The risk associated with Gobert, obviously, not for everyone. Tim Conley was in his own little world there. I don't know if I, I'm not. You know, I don't know if the Scherzer thing is as an extreme example of trading a bunch of stuff for a a very specific older guy in the in the way the the Gobert thing was, and I yeah. think still is. But I think in just in terms of not clearly, maybe not at his apex anymore. Had some very just not viewed in the same way after some failures and things and some time going by i i to me that's that's immediately what came to mind when you say that I, your example is better because it's more unexpected than the one that i had the crazy thing about baseball trades though is how the a team that gets rid of the player is just like oh and by the way we'll we'll pay half the salary like that is a very yeah. not basketball thing that you just get off of your mistake so easily and it's like why would more teams I mean, I, and maybe every team wasn't like going to get the okay because I believe Scherzer had a, a veto ability with all that. But still, it's like, yeah, hey, you get this guy. You don't have to give us very much, and we'll pay half his salary. Like, just 
a very unique uh, little aspect of baseball. But mine was the Thunder trading for Carmelo Anthony when they had Russell Westbrook one. and Paul George. At my, I was a younger person. I wasn't exactly like up on everything from a news standpoint. But I don't remember Carmelo being linked to that team. Like I don't remember that being a long time coming by any means. And then you're like, does he fit there? Does he have anything left to give them? What what is that going to look like? And in the middle of all of it is, it's in Oklahoma. <laughs> like bizarre. The, like the, the the exact opposite market of New York. Yeah. Exactly. I wonder if Melo like ever like had to, but what he did for his home situation in Oklahoma City. Honestly, that would be like one of my like so Carmelo. When you were in Oklahoma City for a hot minute, did you just like rent? Did you like I mean, buy yes. and then flip? Yeah, true, true. I mean, yeah, his dollars had, like, go a lot, lo- a lot further there. So I'm sure you could have had well, like, that the guy, biggest penthouse in the city for what he was making. Yeah, just just some thoughts, just some curiosities mm-hmm. there. Jonathan Taylor trade demand. Let's make it basketball. So it, I, I think the I think the one it would be if it could happen would be a Carl Anthony Towns trade request that we haven't had yet. Here's why: position that is getting squeezed value wise, center. Carl's a center; he's not a power forward. Okay, let's just for the record. You have a situation where clearly a useful player. But, like, how much do we think running backs or Carl Anthony Towns drive winning in the modern version of their sport? It could get really awkward really fast. Mm-hmm. Especially because Carl will go on a podcast and say something absolutely out of pocket. I like it a lot. I like that it's a center because that's where I went. I thought about DeAndre Ayton, but he didn't ever really quite demand a trade. And I'm not sure his apex was really comparable. Like, you're talking about Jonathan Taylor was the best running back in the NFL for a season like mm-hmm. I know a lot of players have been the best running back in the NFL for one season because that tends to be how that position works to your point but eight never quite got there the funny part though is the reason this one is hard is like even the cat one he actually did get paid like they already gave him the super max so it's more like they're the ones panicking to get rid of him which I guess it is similar but they already made the mistake that the Colts are trying to avoid making um the one that I came up with was Kawhi wanting out of San Antonio. But in that case, there was really no disagreement over them paying him. They wanted to pay him, but he wanted out. So it's not one-to-one. I guess I was just thinking like his peak was very, very high. It kind of came abruptly that there was a fracturing with the team. And some of it was related to questions over injuries. That was where I was coming from with Kawhi and the Spurs, but I agree the center running back thing is the key, is the key there. If you're if you're, I guess, a center can win that that battle with their team so long as they get drafted to a historically awful franchise that just is desperate to retain talent. And <laughs> Jonathan Taylor didn't get so lucky. Yeah, and I the owner part of this I think is the hardest part because like we you need an owner who's willing to go out and say some really outlandish stuff that like a PR team is absolutely freaking out about. So like, I don't know if like a Rod would do that necessarily. I was gonna say just wait till a Rod gets behind a mic for the first time. We haven't actually heard him have to speak as owner yet. <laughs> he gets behind sure, a mic it, analyzing it, baseball plenty, but when he has to be like, so. Uh, why did you guys undercut Jaden McDaniels' second contract and lead to him being really mad at your team? And then he has to say something. I'm actually really looking forward to that. Sure. Okay. Maybe he's the answer. But it'd be like, I think like uh, the the 8-1 with Matt Ishbia, if that had been like exactly, you could have seen Ishbia just like on Bill Simmons, like maybe just saying something out of pocket. You know what I mean? Just like, like, whoops. Or like Isaiah Thomas via Matt Ishbia saying something like to a local newspaper reporter. Mm-hmm. How is the how is by the way how is the Isaiah Thomas shadow regime? Is that so like is that up and running? Is is James Jones like like what's going on over there? They've played some damage control on it, so they okay. Brian Windhorst reported that he's around a lot, but there's there's no formal role. He's not really in Phoenix much, whatever. And then like the week that story came out, Isaiah's courtside for every Vegas uh, every game in Vegas for summer league, so. We are uh, we are very much TBD, and if you read between the lines on the Wendy story, you would have been able to tell that he's not fully convinced that their line, uh, corporate line, was was actually legitimate either. Um, but we got ourselves to the Timberwolves naturally there, Chris. So we can 
move on to the man of the hour and one of our most exciting players heading into the season. Yes, I'm pulling up the quote. Uh, this is something. Anthony Edwards, number one, rules. And he's changing his jersey number uh, from one to five. I guess we'll talk about that in a second. I want to start with this quote that he, he gave. Um, via, I think like a some kind of like product promotion thing. I don't really understand what this was. But he that was getting guy, a bag. A, and then he spoke. So, uh, so Air, Air Inc. is who tweeted this. He's, they're only... Instagram posts. Um, it's an ultimate player focus sports app, reimagining how fans consume the game's most exciting moments. I, I okay, sure. Don't understand what that means. Um, their only Instagram post inv- is their the the video. the The cap of the video is Anthony Edwards dunking in it. So I guess he's involved in this company. Um, I guess they asked him a question of like, who do you want to play in the playoffs? And he said, I want to play the Warriors wherever they at. I want to get to them because Draymond talks so much trash. Anthony Edwards, God bless you for that answer. God bless you for wanting to go and get Draymond. We need more guys willing to engage Draymond on his turf. We, the league is more fun when that happens. This is it. So, uh, yes, absolutely. I love that he doesn't. In an era where so many players are so hesitant to say anything because they tend to get rightfully... Uh, they're rightfully worried because they do genuinely tend to get dragged for no reason. But he doesn't care about any of that. And it feels like, you know, not to make an insensitive link to some of the stuff that he references in the the number change story that has been out there about him since Georgia. It just seems like he's been through a bunch of shit and the nonsense of like what people might tweet about him just does not matter to... Anthony Edwards like he's had family members pass away he has a really close relationship with his brother that they kind of like figured out a way to get into the NBA and and develop him the right way mentally and physically to to get to a point where he can be a high level pro athlete and just you hear him talk and it's like it's not even that he's doing it to try to get attention it's just like how he feels and he's really not nervous about how that might come across like he's the type of guy who will call people out and lose to them and no one cares because it's just like oh yeah well and still cool whatever he gets a pass yeah i don't think we're getting like joke in like jordan Poole became like i think the butt of a lot of jokes in the last several months and like i've you know like i see the the drake challenge in college video a lot on my instagram feed i see you know people make like saying how sad he looks in in dc like mm-hmm. you know like all this stuff and it's like I don't think Ant's ever going to get, like, like on a, in a social media era, ever going to get viewed, like, unflattering. Like, he's kind of old school in that way. Like, where he's kind of holding up, like, the epitome of the Kobe kind of disciple. He's kind of picked up that baton in a way that I don't know if any other young guy has. And I think that's going to endear him. I think you're right. It's just going to endear him to people forever. No one's going to, like, bat an eye about what, what Ant is or Ant is not. And that, that in itself is, is a very, very cool thing. Yeah, it's interesting you say Kobe. Like, I almost think of... Kobe was in your face about it. And Ant, like, I think you're right. Like, it's not an in-your-face thing. It's like a... It's a genuine thing. And I think that's why people yeah. just are, are gravitating. I think that's why we've become cheerleaders of his in a way. Right. Well, I, I don't know what the best, I, I like, think, historical I, person to point to would be. Maybe, like, Dwayne Wade. Yeah, but even... I, I would say, like, he's obviously not... It's not as... The Kobe thing is like a re- like a WWE wrestling myth at this point, like right, mm-hmm. like he is got like a an energy onto himself, and obviously I think in passing has something to do with that. But even before, like that guy is held up as like yeah. the Mamba mentality thing was just held up as as a bastion of something we didn't have. And Ant isn't exactly obviously the same, but he's still so young that I kind of think it's like it's it's like the twenty twenty three version of that. You sure. know, the work ethic I, I think, I think is, that, is legit. Like yeah. Austin yeah. Rivers had Ant on his podcast a while back, which I think we talked about briefly when it happened. And he was just like, oh, yeah, I just pretty much like am in the gym. like, And then I'll like play video games with my brother, maybe go out to eat here and there. But, like, he, he, is not, he, is, he is not going on podcast saying he has changed basketball, like one of his teammates. Well, what's is. funny, and I was thinking about it as I was saying that about Ant just having like a more grounded perspective, is I actually think like as much as it is fair to mock Cat because he just goes so over the top, I actually think that they're kind of similar in that way. 
Like we we know the cat story in recent years has been, you know, losses, mental health issues, and what last year he has said was almost an Achilles tear. Like he tried to come back from the calf injury and aggravated mm -hmm. it to a point where he almost tore his Achilles or like kind of messed with the area of his leg that that, you know, is involved in and that's why he took so long to get back and yet he's still out here kind of acting confident and I, I do think he has a similar type of mentality the the other part of the MVP or why did I say MVP jump the gun part of the number change story that jumped out to me was Ant saying that he wanted to help Cat win MVP I do not understand their relationship I don't either we had the hot Cheeto incident of cat saying that ant ate too many hot cheetos and then like it doesn't seem like anthony edwards ever takes the opportunity to like show anyone that he's aware that he's the best player on this team but he is like i think he still thinks towns is uh, like a head and shoulders above him in the pecking order do you think he actually thinks that or he just wants to be humble and be supportive of a teammate that he's really young um I wonder if that changes this year. Like, I think this is the to. end. It has to for both of their sake, I think. Yeah. Um, Brendan, it's actually this. I, I want to keep talking about Ant. And so I just want to transition us to the guys we came with to see because he's my number one draft pick. Yeah. I think, the, I, I think the Anthony Edwards breakout is coming. I think this is the year. I think this is the year that Anthony Edwards, like, just fully ascends. I think it is staring us in the face, and it's going to be awesome to see. I, I really think this this is what's coming. We already know it's his team, but I think that's going to be written in Sharpie by, like, December. I, I really think that's where we're headed here. I hope so. I, I love him. We love him. We've been, you know, he's one of the, uh, you know, mascots of the Just Basketball show so far. I think you look at his season last year where he – increased his I would say the main things are a little bit of an increase in terms of playmaking ability and getting to the free throw line he plays all the time and we've seen him just step up in the playoffs to such a degree that you just expect that it's coming I mean he was 32 points per game against Denver in the first round 48 35 85 shooting splits but he just hasn't really had a dominant two-way regular season yet. And it's only been three years, so that's fine. But you're right to kind of point out that like that that moment hasn't really come for him yet in terms of the actual like really dominant year. Do you think that it's possible to have that happen while they're still figuring out the Towns Go Bear thing? Which is going to happen because they didn't really get the time to do that last year. That's the one part where I would be worried is if this was fully year two of Towns Go Bear and it's just like, we know what this is and we're going to hand the keys to Ant and, and take it for a spin, then I would I would be all on board. I just get a little nervous that that tandem is going to still have some feeling out going on and it might hold him back a bit. I just think, I think that's fair, but I also think this guy might just be so good that it doesn't matter. I really just think he is going to be so transcendent, so aggressive, so elevated. I I just think I think particularly because Towns was out last year and he he kind of got a taste of what it's going to be like to be the guy on offense in a lot of ways, right? I don't think you can roll that back with him, and I think particularly if the Wolves want to be serious about whatever they're going to be, I think they kind of have to embrace this. I think that's the only path forward for them here is to embrace and is to embrace Jaden McDaniels a little bit more. And if that means Carl takes way more catch and shoot threes and he gets fewer post ups, I think the team's better for it. I think Carl's better for it. I think everyone's better for it if they go this one route. So I, I kind of I feel like Ant's inevitable. I I really think we're just staring down something with him where he's going to be too good to to deny even within some of the the structural concerns we might have. Plus five thousand odds MVP that MGM. Throw a dollar on it. I'm not like gonna like go right. I'm not you know I don't think the Wolves are going to be good enough. I I kind of. Is Jokic the favorite for MVP? Um, yeah, plus four hundred, plus five hundred for Luca, five fifty for Giannis, plus six hundred for Embiid. That's kind of the 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 top pack right now. I'm Luca. This might be the Luca might be like my my pick if I was going to bet. Skinny right Luca is getting your attention. He won you over. Yeah, but then I think about that. I remember that Kyrie's on that team, and I have no idea what the Mavericks will be or Jason Kidd's a good coach. And then I'm just like, I don't know. 
Brennan, this is not what we're going to talk about, but I wonder if we get a weird MVP this year. Actually, what is it? Devin Booker would be like uh, in the running for me if he plays yeah, like seventy games. We have a son coming up on my list, so we'll we'll save that. The Wolves are over under Josh Okogie. Win- <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, win totals forty three and a half. I think they hit the over. E- I don't want to say easy. I think they could easily hit the over. I don't think they will easily do it, but that the pathway is there. That's only three games over five hundred, and this is a team that sure. I think in the regular season should be. They're deep. They're going to be a top 10 defense, I would think. Like, I like that. Um, all right, I'll go to my next one, my first one, which is Chris Tapp's Porzingis. This is a good one. I, I, he is, this is still one of the weirdest things that I have wrapped my mind around that he plays for the Boston Celtics now. I just keep thinking back to the conversation we had late in the year when we did that, like, were these career years real episode? And we talked about him. We talked about Butler, Jimmy. We talked about, uh, I think, maybe even Dame and maybe Zach Levine. There were, like, a few guys we went through. We were, like, real or not real. De'Aaron Fox with his, like, insane pull-up two shooting. And it was just like, is this just how offensive inflation is going to work where guys are going to look awesome in the regular season and then dip down and I think there is a case to be made that that is true he had his by far his best two-point shooting season ever you know as a rim protector he flashed which I do think is real but he just kind of had carte blanche to do whatever he wanted and that's not going to be the case in Boston and I just worry that some of what didn't work with him and Luca in terms of him really having to complement another player and attack out of like spot up situations and go entire, you know, stretches of games where he doesn't see the ball, that all that stuff could be a problem. On the other hand, I think he's going to fit really nicely into their dribble handoff offense. And you can see some of that just perfectly clicking into place where he's just, you know, quick little two man game with Jason Tatum pick and pop or, trail three or these types of things like I think offensively I think he can be productive it's just does everything work the same when his usage isn't as high and then does the defense pan out enough for him to keep their identity relatively intact and actually add to it rather than making them really a lot worse in one aspect of the game which they could get I think he is just so at the. I, th- I think this is a great shot because he is at the center. Porzingis is at the at the literal center of everything that is going to change defensively for Boston. That that's what this is to me. I, I think you look at him, and you look at what he is and what he is, and on both ends of the floor, and you can talk yourself into him being a guy that I think can can be competitive. I think there's clearly a type of player he is that Brad Stevens has an interest in, right? Like. You know, shooters like a, a shooting five, a stretch five kind of thing feels very much like something Brad Stevens has wanted. But this only works if the gamble you're making that he's going to be able to be healthy and be effective on offense doesn't change, doesn't take away from your defense, which is very much at the center of what has made you successful these last two seasons under two different coaches. Obviously, you you just can't switch as much with Porzingis. Um, and he obviously already got a contract extension. So, like, Boston's kind of already committed to this. There's a lot of pressure on Porzingis. It's kind of now or never for him, Brennan, for, for this for this to work. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about how they can't switch, but, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean they'll be worse defensively. That just means they'll be different. No, but, so it, they... it, but it's, a, it's a change, and it's like I th- that's not something that is going to look good in September. It might take until December or January or February for that to really set in and, and what that looks like. Yeah, what's interesting to me is the connection to Jalen Brown. So the the Wizards were uh, two points better defensively per 100 possessions with Porzingis on the floor last year. That's pretty good. And was one of the better impacts for a big man in the league last year. They weren't a great defense overall, but he, he made them better. Talked about the rim protection. So I just think a more like straightforward defense is – going to ask more of what I would expect. I mean, Jalen Brown and Derek White. But those guys are going to be able to need to need to be able to navigate screens, prevent 
easy, you know, pull up jumpers or drives to the basket and things like that. Like it's not just how the big man stuff changes and maybe what Robert Williams has to do or what Al Horford has to do when he's when they're playing with Porzingis, but it's also these guards and wings who have been entrusted to basically just like hold their own on the ball and that's kind of the main job. If they don't switch as much, you're asking them to really adjust what they're great at. I think Derek White can do that. I Jalen Brown, you know, people's opinions of him defensively vary and they're losing Marcus Smart. So that that part of it, the ripple effects defensively are, are what I'm really interested in too. So it's like, what is what is he going to be? Can he keep it up? But also everybody's going to have to adjust so much to him um, that it's going to be really fascinating. And for a team that's so good and so consistently good to throw such a wrench in is pretty crazy. Um, I can move on to my next one because it's pretty quick and we can bounce back right. to your list. Caleb Martin. Let's get it. Okay, I I like that you've gone like deep cuts. Is Porzingis a deep kind cut? Of, I mean, like he's, but it, I I think it's it's a good blend of like name guy, but not at the forefront of Boston. Like you could have been like it's, it's called Jaylen. content creation, Chris. Okay, it's but called the layup. strategically crafting a list to generate great conversation. And you're letting the cat out of the bag. The Wizard of Oz has been revealed. Um, Caleb Martin is. Let me just ask you this off the bat: Does he go to the Portland Trailblazers? in the next two months for Damian Lillard? Do they have to give Probably. him a lot? Like you, like you would think yes, right? I, I would think yes, but I still maintain that Miami has the leverage here, and I feel like their level of desperation to keep him might actually win out. I think that's right, and I think they really if you're, need him. Yeah, and like Portland has less of a need for what Caleb Martin is if in this new post game era. Like that's just someone that teams would immediately be, he would immediately go to the top of the list of other teams are calling about this guy incessantly trying it's to just get him. Just because he's in a old, trade. right? Like I actually I do think skill wise he fits with Portland, but it's like they have yeah. Chris Murray and they have some of these guys where it's like they they want to prioritize that, not you know twenty eight year old Caleb Martin. So. Let's just I, I appreciate that you're calling tw- are you, 28 is not old, Brendan. You're, you're not even 28, are you? What are you, 26? Uh, I'm not 28. That's because that's why it's old. Because I'm not it. Well, so, everybody older than I'm me here. is old. No, I'm just kidding. All right, fine. Uh, Caleb Martin, though, let's assume he stays in Miami. Let, that That's like the thought exercise that I want to do. I don't really care about how he would look next to Scoot Henderson. So I just think, like, it, one, I'm excited and intrigued by him because of the trade dynamic, but once the season actually starts them needing to keep him also then translates into them needing him to play really well. And he wasn't exactly consistent in the postseason. He had good series. The first two, basically he was really good against Milwaukee, really good against the Knicks and then had moments against Boston, but wasn't consistently great in that series. And then in the finals kind of disappeared, frankly, as an offensive player. And I think that's a big part of why they were, I guess the Boston series, it's not fair to call him inconsistent. Let's just say he was inconsistent throughout the first three rounds and then fell off. He's now, uh, you know, on, I think the, the end of his contract, this is the final year of it. And he will have to defend the, best forward every night for what will be a championship contender. And the expectations will be much greater than when they were the cute eight seed. And he was able to break out organically. I just think it's a lot riding on a player who hasn't proven a ton, but is suddenly extremely fundamental to what they're going to want to do in their best chance to win a title in the Jimmy era. Yeah. I mean, I I think, I think you kind of nailed that. I don't have, a ton to add to that one. I think you're dead on that. Like they kind of need to keep him unless they're just going to again, find someone in Sioux falls or Duncan Robinson's going to be like figured I mean, out. It's again, like probably right? Haywood Highsmith would have to kind of be the starter. I would guess. Cause even Duncan, even if they kept him and his salary doesn't go out in the Dame trade, he's not really a four, which is what they've used Caleb Martin as. So Jovich, I guess, but like, yeah, uh, Caleb Martin has a player option next summer for $7.1 million. If he plays anywhere close to what he did in the postseason this upcoming regular season, then he will opt out and they'll have to pay him. So he has like that kind of behind his sales too, but it's going to be a thin team even if they get Dame. Yeah. Um, and you bank in like Jimmy misses some time and, and wherever that looks like. 
it's going to be interesting. And they, they, I think they need the depth. All right, my next one, Brendan. Um, I'm going to Oklahoma City here. Okay. And, and I'm going to go Josh Giddy. Here's why. I think Chet would be the easy answer here if I wanted to just pick the obvious one. I think he's the one kind of figuring out where he is. He's the one where I think I have the most uncertainty about what he is in this court. It's like, I know what Chet I think is going to be. We know what Shea is. That's an all-NBA guy. The really good Jalen Williams is established now. Like, I, we'll see what year two looks like for him. You could put him on this list as well just to see how he follows up his rookie year. But I love that guy. Giddy as this passer, as this guy who can't really shoot it yet, as as maybe like an attractive trade piece for them if they needed to go a certain direction. He's just kind of like in – he's never going to be on this team like the 1A, 1B. And like some of the playmaking stuff that he provides is going to maybe get superseded over time um, by, by Jalen Williams. Where does he fit? What does he look like? How does he improve this year? I think he, as much as Chet hitting the ground running, is going to have a lot to say about what the Thunder are going to be. We're like on the ground floor, I think, of whatever the Thunder are building. We're very invested in this, I think. We're very intrigued by it. I'm very optimistic about it. Yeah. But I think Giddy's, Giddy's, what what happens with Giddy is going to have a lot to do with, with what's coming there. I don't know. You said you don't know what he is in this core. I don't know if I know what he is, period. He's such an interesting yeah. player. Like he... 73% from the free throw line last year and 43% from mid-range makes it even more confusing. And 40% from corner threes. So it's like, can he shoot or can he not shoot? I don't know. I don't feel like I can even say one way or the other on that. And I don't, I, as, I start to not know if he fits with their core because maybe he's not quite as athletic, maybe not quite as like forceful and overwhelming. But then it's like, well, he has the size that they want, and he plays hard as hell in that play-in game. He was like the one non-Shea player who you felt like was really ready for that. And you mm -hmm. wouldn't have been able to tell him in that moment that he couldn't shoot. Like He's like, I, I don't care. We need something, and I'm going to be the guy to make that happen. And like you can't ignore that as like an evaluation of him, and you also can't ignore that if you are in Oklahoma City trying to evaluate if you want to keep a guy like that because... He cares, and that that's not really replaceable all the time. So I don't even want to say this year is a big year for him, but I definitely feel like, you know, after this season he will be extension eligible and the expensiveness of the team will start to come into clarity and all that stuff. So he doesn't have to, like, turn into an all-star right away, but I think we want you probably want to know the what is he question a little bit more. I think if you're in a world where you're gonna maybe pay him and you're gonna you're gonna be in a spot where you want to commit to him financially or on next to Shea and planning for the future, I think you absolutely need to figure out kind of a little bit more what he is next year. And there's also just undeniable that he does have a lot of pluses, right? Like the passing stuff with him, the size, the size for the for the passing. I think his his ability to. I think at times as he gets older and better, I think as a defender, he's going to be all right. I think physicality wise, like I don't have like a concern about Giddy being someone that's going to get picked on. Right. Like I, I just, there's a, the, the package physically to me is, is so interesting and I'm a sucker for the passing stuff that even at times when he f slips in and out of games a little bit and you lose track of what he's doing, he'll throw a crazy pass. And you're like, ah, that's right. Josh, that's what Josh Giddy's here for. But is that enough? And what is that worth? I wouldn't be surprised if Sam Presti already has, like, at some point, we'll have a firm idea about this and, and directs it a certain way. It's just such an interesting consideration um, for for how they're going to build this. Because if you, it almost wouldn't make sense for them to pay him in a year just to give themselves another year to figure it out and run it out. I could absolutely see that, oh, but that's course. also yeah. that adds a lot of awkwardness to the whole situation. Yeah, of course. I, I think you have to pay him if if you. Even to just to it. trade him, or at least maybe even if to trade him and exactly to somewhere else that loves him. You can't let him go or, or piss him off and go to restricted free agency or any of that. It's just how much do you pay him and do you keep him and all that stuff that starts to be a question. Yeah, he, he's super interesting. Um, my next one is going to be Keegan Murray, another deep-ish cut, but he's on he's on my list as well. So we have some overlap here. He's oh, really? he's the obvious candidate. Look, Sacramento's the story of last year in a lot of ways. One of the stories of last year. I think his...
breakout, especially because they just ran it back with Harrison Barnes and didn't give a real upgrade. If there's a breakout to come with someone on that team, I think it kind of has to it has to be him. There, there's not like another candidate on this team to ascend in a way that we're not expecting. It's funny that you told me I had a deep cut with Chris Epps, Porzingis, and then you went Josh Giddy, Keegan Murray. That is a, a little bit funny. But Look, I'm I'm catering to the TikTokers with uh, with Josh Giddy, okay. and I'm cater and I'm catering to the great film director Greta Gerwig with the Sacramento Kings pick. All right, I love it. Uh, Keegan Play, Murray playing 40 chess is absolutely the guy who will have to develop if if Sacramento is going to continue to get better. I feel like they I didn't love their off season, but then what he did in summer league made me pretty excited. And so it's not just like blind optimism that Murray can do it. I mean, every step of his career, I would say since they drafted him, he's exceeded my expectations. I mean, he was kind of panned as their pick and then had an awesome rookie season. He started off the playoffs a little weird with the first couple games against Golden State and then absolutely blew expectations out of the water by the end of that series, taking shots that other guys were afraid to take and, and making them and taking guys off the bounce and just looking like he belonged. And then again, goes to Summer League and just immediately was it was like unfair for him to be out there. And they didn't even play him in Vegas. They only played him in their home games than the challenge that they do. So... I'm ready to continue to be surprised by him. And I think he's one of the only guys on the roster too that looks like they can have any chance at creating their own shot and being an actual offensive engine for them. They don't have a a ton of young talent, and so it kind of has to be, but he's also shown it. So I I love it. I think he... I think he's the perfect Kings type of story where he's going to continue to get doubted and continue to, to exceed expectations. And I wouldn't be surprised if by the time he's eligible for a, a contract, it's like, is Keegan Murray going to get a max? Like, I think, I think he, what he's shown already, he is on that track. Uh, Brandon, my next one is probably the deepest cut of all. And it's, it's partially because we just saw him score, um, 83 games in a pro-am, and that's Marshawn Bochamp for the Milwaukee Bucks. So I think maybe need him to really step up. This is a team that is in need of of someone to add to what they are, to give them some youth, to give them some energy, to give their their pretty old team some vibrancy. Is he the best candidate for that? I think that's kind of where we're at with that team. And I don't know if he's going to be ready. You know, 83 in a pro-am doesn't necessarily tell you anything it is very cool that he did 83 at the, at the crossover which is one of the the coolest most known pro-ams we have um lebron tatum palo chet kpj john Murray have all played there like a ton of guys have played there um isaiah thomas had 81 in that last year when i was reading up about this like he like this is a place where people go take a ton of shots get a ton of points it's very cool i'm really excited to see if he can if he can be someone that can give the bucks something this year um 2020 24th overall pick in 2022 played at summer league this year only appeared in 51 games last year can he become someone that actually matters for the bucks this year is is i think an interesting question for for what's coming for them yeah he uh part of why i believe in him so much is i just think his ability to be comfortable somewhere is impossible to ignore he went to one, two, three, four, five high schools, and I believe three colleges, or at least two colleges, before he ever ended up at G League Ignite. So, mm-hmm. uh, two colleges, and then G League Ignite. So this is not one of the guys who ends up at Ignite with a bunch of prestige and uh, you know glamour around him. He was at one point a very, very highly rated high school prospect, but went through some ups and downs, had to go to the community college route and everything else, ended up at Ignite, really, really showed out there. But he's already 23, and even just hearing his interviews at Summer League, you felt like there was a level of confidence and just ability to finally take a deep breath and work on his game that he was emphasizing a lot. And like a lot of guys say that, but when you match it with actual ability, it, it tends to be good. He ended summer league with worse numbers than some of his best performances would indicate. He, he didn't shoot the ball from deep very well, which was really the one thing. But he, he increases in efficiency from two 
and and everything else. He has good size. He can handle the ball. He he makes good decisions. I don't know if they'll start the the season with him like you know the seventh man with a lot of weight on his shoulders, but it definitely feels like the kind of thing to me where they'll know in the back of their minds like he needs to be ready by the playoffs. Yeah, I think that's good. Uh, do you have do you have one more, and then I have one more? I think uh, I have two more, but one of them is also quick. Jalen Green. We've talked okay. a lot about yeah. the Rockets, but to me, this is like not a make or break season. But it is definitely a, you got to prove that you're a guy we're supposed to be investing in here, or you're going to kind of lose your spot on the totem pole a little bit. You know, can you limit your turnovers? Can you consistently take good shots? Can you at least commit to playing good team defense now that, you know, Dylan Brooks will be taking the best wing guy and Fred Van Vliet will be at the point of attack and you get to guard pretty much the third best perimeter guy every night can you handle that and maybe force some steals and you know execute what we're doing and get along with Ime Odoka like it's weird to have that happen so quickly for a top three pick but I think we're there yeah I think that's I have nothing that I think it's very he's new coach all that stuff it's at the Houston team's full of guys I think we, we could pick for this list as far as injury goes uh what's your next one Bradley Beal Okay, this is... By the way, Brennan, really like the Suns in New Jerseys. I'm a fan. Hmm. Don't hate them. Don't love them. I, 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 I think it blends like modern and this like real callback to 90s aesthetic that we're seeing right now in, in a lot of different ways with clothes being bigger again and, and all that stuff. I think this is like a good blend of some modern sleekness and, and not being too busy with, with a, a very large chess logo that is very much a throwback to the 90s. Yeah, see, but what they're losing is the literal retro jerseys that they had last year, which were just like pretty much a recreation of their 90s jerseys. So this is like yeah. not quite as good. So Suns fans are disappointed because we all enjoyed having those back in our lives last year. But no, they're not bad. And it sounds like they'll actually be around for multiple seasons, which... Uh, thank God, can Nike please chill on the jerseys and just allow people to, yeah, whatever. Different different conversation for a different day, but that bothers me. Bradley Beal, though, I mean, is there any one individual player who the championship might live or die by more than Bradley Beal? I mean, Porzingis was on my list for similar reasons, but Beal is better than him, probably, and has to pan out for the Suns to get where they want to go. Whereas Porzingis, maybe not. I almost, I almost, yeah, I think because there's a lot of pressure on him to maybe be the point guard, it seems like he's going to like nominally be the point guard at times. Do you think is, if I've read those quotes correctly or I'm thinking of them correctly? It's hard to tell. I mean, they haven't said anything. So it's more just people's guesses. And Zach Lowe had a big piece about Beal likely handling a lot of those responsibilities i think come playoff time we'll probably see booker morph into that role but beal definitely is going to have to do it more than he did playing next to john Ever? wall or playing games that didn't matter the past couple of years sure that's a, and it's because he you can't trade him if this doesn't work really like, he has the no-trade clause. He's not going to be like, yeah, dump me to wherever. Like, he's going to have control over his future still. There's a lot of pressure, I think, on both sides to make this work. I, I almost would have went Booker because I think the ascending superstar is kind of the, the pick for this in a lot of ways in, in, in that case for Booker me. Booker has done been ascended. That That's over. The ascension but it's, has I, arrived. I, I, he's... I He's just, there. I think there's an, I just think there might be like another leveler, like in our, in our collective consciousness. I look, Brendan, I've been Booker pilled via watching him a bunch and talking to you a bunch. Well, I'm it just, just felt like a different. cheat, right? I mean, like, it's like saying like, yeah, I'm really looking forward to looking at LeBron James on the basketball court come October. So like, he, I mean, no look, okay, here's Thank the, you. okay. But here's the thing. Number six on my list would have been LeBron because it's like, what does he look like coming off of all these injuries? And what does he even like have in this, yeah. in this other year? Like post, like what, what is this even going to look like? We have no historical precedence for what LeBron season is going to look like, but that's, that's an, that's a Lakers season preview podcast. Here's question. the distinction though, is I just think Booker's going to do what we think he's going to have to do like okay, sure you know it's like booker has to increase his playmaking responsibilities remain as efficient as he was last year probably defend a higher caliber of player on a nightly basis and be more of a leader for the team 
and all these other things. And it's like, yep, check, 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 check. So I'm excited, I guess, in like the purest sense of that word, but I'm not as like intrigued because it's like in that case, let me just sit back with some popcorn and watch it all happen. With Beal, it's like, eh, can he actually do all the stuff that we're concocting in our brains that he's going to have to do because we just haven't seen it in a long time pretty much since he was playing with john wall like six years ago yeah. all right uh i think i've only if i given i've given three correct i think uh i am not sure but we had keegan murray in common i know that okay so keegan murray marshall giddy. bochamp giddy and, and who's and. My fr- okay so here's, here's one my more. fifth I was gonna. My original pick for this was Lamelo Ball, so let's put him on on the cutting room floor for this for a second. I'm gonna turn my attention, Brennan, to Kay Cunningham. Mm. Let's get another member of that draft class. <laughs> it's a it's an organization that I think clearly wants to be something better than it has been, and we have not seen him in a year functionally. Where we have a year, another year of tape on Jalen Green in weird circumstances. We have a, ta- a year of tape on Scotty Barnes. We have another year of Evan Mobley and saw where he struggled in the playoffs. We haven't seen Cade in a year. They have a new coach. They have these pieces that he hasn't had a chance to gel with yet. Does he hit the ground running? Is it a is it a reset for him? Are the Pistons competitive at all this year when they were often one of the the most depressing teams to watch last year? I think there's just a lot on his shoulders to make Detroit work this year. So, for, and he's coming off an injury, we just don't know what he's going to look like 100. I mean, all the there's no there's nothing we've read or heard that has indicated I think that there's a concern about what his health is going to be like. No, he's he's been working out and he's going to be part of the select camp. So I think he's fine now. Yeah, and but that, that doesn't mean he can he, play basketball at a high level. To your point, but like he's back. Right, right. So, but what does this look like? And is he does he pick off like where to me I think he's to me he'd be number two behind Mobley in that draft class if I was redrafting it today I I love Kate I love his game it's such a moderate NBA pick it's why he went number one but what does this look like a, a year away in a new Pistons organization in a new setup in Detroit I, I think there's a lot on him to to be the one that kind of elevates that yeah it's all on him I mean they just they don't even have like a real kind of proven co-star yet you know and and I, I think he has an even tougher path than a lot of these other young guys I mean even at this point like compare him to Jalen Green like I think Jalen Green will have a more insulated developmental opportunity this year than Cade will wouldn't you say I mean Jalen Green has I mean we just went through it like he's gonna guard the third best guy and Maybe not even handle the ball all the time. Whereas Kate, it's like, you're our offense. And by the way, hope you feel healthy. And we just paid a coach a bunch of money, so you better start winning. Like, yeah, it's a ton of difficulty for him. I, I don't think it's going to be an easy season for him, but I, I agree with you. I think he's good enough to kind of weather that storm. What did you think of the Monte Morris edition for them? When you think about Jaden Ivey being there and I Kate think being it, there, I and think, then it's like another point guard that's a veteran. I, I'm a little that one confused me, even though they didn't have to give up a lot to get him. Yeah, I get it from a just like let's have an adult point guard option and to to clearly maybe help it be a little more help st- help us stomach some of the ups and downs a little bit. I think that's where that comes from. It would would be my guess, right? Like I think yeah. that's what that's about. But if Jaden Ivey ascends, if Kate ascends, then it's like, okay, like we can trade him or we can just not play him and they'll be yeah, okay. Yeah, but I'm more worried about like, does that mean Cade's off the ball more? Well, is that their vision here? I mean, uh, would it, would it, let, devil's advocate, would it be bad for him to get some reps off ball a little bit more? I don't think it would be bad for him to get reps off ball. I think he's a good enough shooter that who cares and he can post up and do some different things as a scorer, but. I just think for the betterment of the overall team, I, I do kind of feel like you you want him on ball, especially if, yeah, I mean, it's exactly what we said when we reviewed the Pistons offseason, and I made the whole point of, like, I could easily see Monty Williams, not Monte Morris, but Monty Williams rolling a lineup out there of, you know, Morris, Cade, Joe Harris, Boyan Bogdanovich, and, like, let's say Jalen Duran because he kind of is their only good center just because that's comfortable yeah 
you know, and it's like, Sar- is that, the- that going to yeah. be best for development? Uh, so, you know, Asar Thompson isn't even in that road in, in that lineup. Neither is Jaden Ivy. Neither are some of these other guys. So maybe for Cade, that's all that matters. And him playing with better veteran players is, is just good. And you figure out the rest, but it makes me a little nervous of kind of what the, the rotation is going to be and what the lineups are going to be. Cause they're sending, a, they're sending some different messages with where they actually are versus where they've think they might be and i i hope k doesn't get caught in the crossfire of that yeah i think that that's fair i think the starting five that i think i would like to see that would kind of maybe walk the toe the line of these two realities a little bit would be Cade, jaden ivy joe harris bojan and duran i i think that five gives you two vets who can really shoot it and turns the playmaking over to your two young guys and then you know you can you can play Monty Morris off the bench you can play their Thompson twin off the bench like you Isaiah can still Stewart. play yeah yeah you can play Isaiah Stewart you can play James Wiseman like you you have got younger guys you can just bring off the bench and and see what you got and Alec Burks can be your your bench vet who can who can really shoot it at least until you you maybe trade him to to a team that looks for a rental at, at the shooting guard spot yeah it's not it's not hopeless but it's a little weird it, it definitely feels like a transition season which doesn't always make for the best winning or development, but maybe they make it work. I do think Monty will help a lot. Yeah. Do you have, uh, I think, are, nope, is that it. is that a wrap? All right, that's a wrap. Those are our five apiece guys we came with to see next season. Apologies to LeBron James, who, who you know, just couldn't make the cut this time, I guess. Anyone on your cutting room floor, Brendan? No, but I like the idea of just every list we make kind of like uh, – you know, Jimmy Kimmel does or different people where it's like, we just ran out of time. We should just have LeBron James be the apologies, LeBron. You didn't get this wonderful honor of being on our meaningless list as if he cares. So let's make that yeah. a running bit. Is out here working out with Jalen Johnson, a uh, clutch client and Atlanta Hawks forward. Jalen Johnson is working out with him. Let's be, let's be real here. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's better phrasing. Uh, I think I have to move out of Cleveland because the way I phrase that, I think is is what's going to happen once they find out how I how I structured what I said there. But that's going to do it for the just best. Yeah, tough for me. All right, thanks again for the just to everyone for tuning in to the August third edition of the Just Basketball Show. I'm Chris Manning. That has been Brendan Clean. Thanks again to Dylan Heiser as always for his work on production. Back at you again next week. Really fun episode coming up at the top of next week, covering the new G League documentary coming to Prime Video. We have interviews with people who made it. We're going to talk about the doc itself, kind of doing our our, uh, our own version of the big pick. Uh, I know a podcast Brendan and I both really enjoy. So hope you tune in for that episode. Check out the doc when it comes out uh, so you can have an idea of maybe what we're talking about there. And talk to you all again soon. Enjoy the hoops.